Hello, everyone, and Happy New Year. Welcome to our 2023 update, investment update. This will be the first in a series of videos we'll do throughout the year on various investment and financial planning topics, and we're pleased that you can join us. Today, I'm going to take a few minutes to go over uh, briefly what happened in 2022, very briefly, because I'm sure most of you have been inundated in the news about uh, and throughout the year about what happened, um, and then have a few words about how to think about events in 2023 and, and going forward beyond that. Uh, hopefully, we won't go much beyond uh, 15, 20 minutes today. And uh, let's uh, let's begin. So we all know that it was a very difficult year um, last year. Uh, up on the screen here, I have a slide that shows the results for a portfolio that's a combined 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio, um, starting around 1980. And you can see that this year is the third year, worst year for a stock and bond portfolio since 1950. Actually, at the end of September, at the peak of the down stock and bond down market, it was the worst result at my about instead of minus 16 here it was about minus 25. What, what was noteworthy uh, about this market is that both stock and bond markets went down together which uh, is unusual even if you look at the past years in this chart a lot of times they will go up together and that's because since 1980 we've had a relentless uh, decline in interest rates from around 15 percent to almost less than a, you know less than a percent for 10-year treasuries um and uh, that abruptly reversed uh this year where rates went up substantially and quickly uh and so we also if you include publicly traded real estate the portfolio would have been down a little bit more than 16. so around the world global stock bond and real estate markets declined the global stock markets were down uh, between 15 and 20 percent uh, real estate was down uh, global real estate was down in the low 20s and bond markets uh, in the mid-teens depending on what the composition of your bond market index is but the key thing is they all went down together and uh, largely in a response to interest rates going up quickly and interest rates went up quickly because inflation went up quickly and the federal reserve bank is trying to adjust to that we, uh, when you raise interest rates, traditionally, uh, they are, that's an event very often associated with an economic downturn, slowdown, or even recession. Uh, and that is um, uh, kind of in the cards for a lot of prognosticators in 2023. Uh, that's kind of the consensus. That's not the, uh, the entire um prognosticating world does not hold that belief, but the majority does. Uh, we don't know if the market downturn, into, as far as stocks go, is going to continue into the next year or uh, hold into the next year because we're not sure if uh, market declines are pricing in just the interest rate increase or the interest rate increase plus the probability of a recession. My guess is it's the latter. If a recession actually occurs, there may be a further decline in markets. Um, now, there's a lot going under the on under the hood here. The decline in markets last year was meaningful, but far from the worst annual decline. However, in certain parts of the market, the declines were substantial. So, if we take a look out at the um, uh, some of the more speculative areas, uh, the, on the left, I'm showing Kathy Woods' arc. Uh, uh, innovation fund um, and there are two lines that are visible the green one is the return year to date and the red one is the return from its most recent high so from its most recent high in uh, late 2021 um, that fund which holds a lot of speculative uh, growth type new economy type investments is down 80 percent um and for year to date it was uh about 67 percent of that decline was um, 
experienced. Tesla, um, the elect EV stock, uh, is down close to 70% uh, from its recent high, which was uh, late in uh, 21. And uh, much more than the mark, broad market, which is was down 15 or 16%. The other part of the speculative markets where the crypt was the crypto space, and I don't have crypto stocks here, but I do have a, a, a Bitcoin fund, and it shows from the most recent high again, which was late 2021, from November 2021, down almost 76 percent. Ethereum, another uh, um, cryptocurrency, down a similar amount. This uh, phenomenon, where the broad market declines, but the speculative part of the market declines a lot more is reminiscent uh, of a number of past eras. We've kind of seen this movie before. Uh, the tech, this happened in the tech bubble when the uh, speculative assets delaminated from the broad market. It happened in the go-go years in the late 60s, early 70s, when the speculative part of the market went down and the, and the broad market actually even went up until 73, 74. It happened again in the uh, before the depression in the 20s, uh, 1920s, when um, RCA was the the uh, leading the technology revolution back then with radio, um, we, uh, we saw much the same uh, phenomenon. And so, uh, is this is this over? Uh, I don't necessarily think it's a good time to take a position into speculative growth investments like this just yet. Uh, as far as the economy, are we? Is there a recession? Are we going to have a recession? Well, it's tough to to tell. Um, this is a, a heat map showing uh, manufacturing and services uh, purchasing managers indices. Um, there was just a late reading that came out today, which was a little bit more for December, which is more negative. But you can see. There, uh, it's not bright red like it was in 2020 uh, around the world. Uh, pretty much globally, there was a, a big decline. But at the end of uh, November, there were some shades of uh, uh, growth deceleration in the PMI indices. And now again in December, they're, they're trending a little bit more toward red. So the, um, the gro growth, economic growth is slowing down. Uh, nothing like it was in 2008 or 2020, however. So it's the readings here are not totally out of line with the rise in interest rates that we've seen in inflation. Um, and again, for inflation prospects, uh, we see better news that outside of uh, uh, shelter, that the inflation numbers are decelerating. And we are actually, if you look here on the end, the green is good. The red is not so good. Uh, we're, uh, the inflation is concentrated in shelter areas right now. Um, but the rest of uh, uh, the economy, prices are um, have come way down from earlier in, in 2022 um, and parts of 2021 where there was a lot of red, a lot of accelerating, rising in prices in different categories. Um, so the news on inflation is looking better uh, than, it, than it was um, six months ago. Um, the expectations in the long run uh, from consumers, from investors uh, and forecasters uh, range from, um, in the twos, you know, between two and 3% closer to the two. So people's expectations of where inflation is gonna settle out, it's gonna decline and kind of rest uh, not far from the Fed's target. However, uh, this is a forecast. The charts I showed you before were real-time numbers. Um, what I want to talk about now is uh, a few things on prediction. So when we, um, when you are watching shows on the media about uh, talking about the economy or investments, um, it's always important to remember what these shows are trying to accomplish. They're trying to get you to watch by inciting emotional reactions or try to get you to act by in buying investment products or services, by uh, trying to influence your thinking or feeling. Um, 
and very rarely do we see anything about how uh, the brokerages, the banks, uh, academia, uh, that, that grades their ability to predict the future. We, uh, and we are sold largely uh, in, in my industry. We, what people do is try to, or companies try to do is sell you on their ability uh, to predict the future. And that, it all comes down to that. I personally don't believe it's possible to predict the future uh, in the short run. And, uh, uh, and I'm going to show you some things that bear that out. I think the focus should be more longer run uh, when we are looking at investments, uh, what we can expect in terms of rents, interest, dividends um, over a longer period of time, rather than try to react to the noise that's amplified in the media and by my profession uh, in, over the short term. So first of all, let's take a look at um, this survey of the professional forecasters, which is published by the Philly Fed. Uh, it takes a, a, a number of uh, a large number of pr uh, forecasters uh, from academia, from industry and government, and looks at their, in any given year, their forecast for uh, the 10-year treasury yield going out 10 years. So if you look at the, a point in time, if we uh, look at uh, the peak here on um, just after 2008, um, you can see that almost all the forecasts each year has a, one of these little feathers or ribbons uh, going off from it, which represent the forecast. You can see going way back to the beginning uh, and even even toward more recently that the forecasts are all trending up. So in other words, the professional forecasters for most for the most part, not every year, but almost every year have been predicting rising interest rates in an environment where interest rates have gone down. The black line trends down forecasts at any given year for rates um, throughout the uh, uh, future period are trending up, sometimes sharply. So the forecasters through most of this history were terribly wrong. So the question would be is why would I want to re rely on short-term forecasts of interest rates from my bank, brokerage, investment advisor, government, whoever, when there is so much error. It doesn't get any better if we look at inflation. Here is the same kind of concept where the black line represents the actual inflation number and the little feathers or ribbons are at that point in, ti that point in time, the forecast for future inflation. And you can see there's a lot of herd mentality. Um, the future forecasts here all trend down toward 2%. And 2% happens to be the Federal Reserve's inflation target. So all we're really seeing, uh, even, even when inflation was low, it, it was forecast to go up to the 2% trend. This isn't terribly informative or insightful. Um, and it, it uh, bespeaks of herd behavior which is not unusual. In fact, I should mention that. Um, the forecasts that of interest rates, earnings, uh, um, can be fairly accurate when times are um, not volatile, you know, when the weather is good. Um, it's when we experience changes that they miss. So if I go back um, here, we can see in interest rates, uh, this big decline in interest rates uh, was completely missed by the forecasters. Um, likewise, this big increase in inflation was completely missed by the forecasters. If we look at it, uh, if we rely on current economic data or forecasts to make our investment decisions, listen to the noise in the media or the investment banks or whatever, um, we can uh, miss important turning points. And that's really what diversification is for. It acknowledges the fact that we can't really predict these changes, these important turning points accurately enough, because you not only have to predict the turning point, then you have to get right the effect of the turning point on the different investment markets or asset classes. So in, in other words, okay, if I, let's say I 
correctly forecast inflation was going to be way high, way higher than consensus, what impact would that have on different asset classes? Um, and uh, you know, some of them were predictable. You know, oil went up a lot. Materials, some materials went up a lot, at least through mid-year. Gold uh, finished the year barely positive, but really didn't go up. So it's really hard to uh, do both of those things uh, correctly. And with respect to corporate earnings, so now everybody, uh, I get asked this ad nauseum to the point where I'm, I just kind of uh, uh, shrink in my chair at a party when I, because I get asked this many times, what do you think the market's going to do in 2023? Well, here's what the different uh, big investment firms thought the S&P was going to do uh, for 2022 uh, from the beginning of the year. So this is beginning of 2022 forecasts. And um, if you look, 4,600, 5,300 at, at Bank of Montreal, um, over 5,000 at JP Morgan. Uh, I'm not trying to pick on anyone in particular, but we ended the year at 3839. Here's the takeaway. None of these were close. They were all wrong in the wrong in the same direction. So there's again tremendous herding behavior. All wrong in the same direction. Um, and so the question is, you know, why would we rely or look at these forecasts going forward? So what I would prefer to do over the long run is follow Peter Lynch's advice. I don't know how many of you will know who Peter Lynch is, but he was the manager of the Fidelity Magellan Fund, which was a tremendously successful, uh, actively managed stock fund. Uh, Peter ran it in the 80s and early 90s, and then he retired uh, uh, in the 90s. Uh, when he was on top, uh, uh, he, he left his uh, investment chair um, after putting up some pretty spectacular numbers. And this quote is one of my favorite things ever. Uh, even though he was involved in picking stocks, someone asked, you know, well, what's going to happen uh, in the market? That, that, that question we get asked at parties all the time. You know, some event will come out of left field and the market will go down or the market will go up. Volatility will, will occur. Markets will continue to have these ups and downs. That's about as good a forecast for any year as you can get. Um, basic corporate profits have always grown about 8% a year historically. Um, that means they corporate profits double every nine years. Um, I'm pretty convinced the next, he's, at this point in time, the Dow, he's, I mean, the numbers he's citing here from the Dow was about 3,800 points. He'll go in the, uh, the next um, 3,800 points will be up, it won't be down. And the next, uh, same with the next five or 600 points. But the key thing here um, is that there's a, the markets are a positive sum game. If you're not paying too much for it, so I would put that caveat in, if you're not paying too much for it, um, it doesn't make sense to invest by noise, incur all the costs and taxes that you, uh, most of the listeners here, are going to be um, in the, have investment portfolios where you have to pay taxes and costs on top of everything else. Uh, uh, to incur those expenses or accelerate those capital gains, um, you know, make those decisions based on noise. Uh, when you have a positive drift game of earnings growing, uh, he cites 8% a year. I, the number from the early part of the last century is actually a, a, between five and five and a half. Um, the 8% number would be uh, much more recent numbers. Um, and so what I did here is I took the Dow at 3,800 and I took his 8% a year number for earnings and I took the Dow from where he was in 1994 and would say, given what, what Peter's numbers are, what should the Dow be at today if he was right? Well, um, Peter's uh, calculation would, would result in a Dow, uh, a price Dow, not a total return, of 29600 Well, um, today it's right around 33000 Um and so 
it's a, just a, not only was he uh, right on the positive side, um, the actual market experience was even better than what Peter experienced. Now, look what's happened since 1994. You know, we've had uh, that 1994 was the beginning of the Mexican crisis, then the Thai currency crisis in 97, the Russian crisis in 98, the tech bubble blew up in 2000, the uh, great financial crisis in 2008, 2009, uh, the COVID crisis, and I've, I've missed a few others in there too. All that happened, the, the Ukrainian uh, invasion of Ukraine, all of these things happened uh, in that time period on uh, the market is, uh, is up uh, 33,000, even better than uh, the numbers that Peter Lynch gave us back in 1994. <clears throat> so keeping, your, keep, keeping the eye on the ball is the underlying mechanism that generates these earnings, corporate America still in good shape. Are we paying too much for that engine? Those are the two really big concerns. Um, and I would say that, yes, the, the um, uh, corporate America is in very good shape. Uh, we are paying a little bit much for a dollar of earnings in today's market, but um, not in uh, like in a bubble in, in 73, 74 or times like that. So here's a little snapshot at valuations. The number on the right is the cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio by Robert. Uh, Robert Schiller, which takes the last 10 years of earnings adjusted for inflation, averages them and divides by the current price. So this is the what you're paying for an uh, average dollar of inflation adjusted earnings over the last 10, year, 10 years um, is right around 30. If you look at the gold, it just takes trailing 12 month earnings. So it's what are the earnings from the last 12 months divided by the price? And this number is pretty much it's below the most recent historical average from say 1990 is 2021, 22. Uh, and the long run average is around 16. So that's not too expensive. The Cape number is expensive, but that kind of shows that the uh, earnings growth, um, uh, the, the, the price expansion in the US market's gone up a little more than earnings growth. Um, outside the US, things are uh, on a trailing 12-month basis, w below, in some cases, way below historical averages and not at all outrageously priced. And then if we look at that over time, these prices in the stock markets, we can see the, the line on top here is, is that CAPE measure. So this is not return. This is valuation. How much are we paying for a dollar of corporate earnings um, uh, averaged over the last 10 years? Um, kind of like the price per square foot in real estate, a, a metric of valuation in the same spirit. Uh, we can see the U.S. is on top. Note that previous to uh, 2015 or so, other countries or regions were on the top. The big one over here is during the Japan bubble or, uh, in the late 80s. And this is the Pacific on the left, far left. Uh, but today you can see most of the rest of the world is much less expensive than the US and uh, EM countries are priced not far from where they were at the pit of despair in 2008, 2009. And the rest of the world is much less expensive. So we're not in a situation going into an uncertain future this year, recession, no recession, slowdown, no slowdown, inflation. We're not going into these this an environment like this where things are really expensive and we could be worried about a downdraft that might persist. Um, uh, for most of the world, the U.S. is a little bit pricey, but not like it was in the tech bubble. So talk a little bit about what people are seeing going forward. So these are not prognostications on the net economy next year, whether it be a recession, recession or not. These are investment expectations from different organizations. This one's BlackRock, uh, ostensibly the world's greatest asset manager, or not greatest, excuse me, largest asset manager, um, showing what they think returns are going to be on different types of assets um, over the next 10 years on average. And so this is more of the type of thing I like to pay attention to. And uh, we can see at the top in the green, I'm, I'm just going to focus on equities here, but you can see uh, that 
Emer European and emerging market equities have high, the highest returns um, going forward for the 10 years, and the U.S. Uh, have positive returns but much lower. And the, the, one of the biggest reasons is a valuation difference I showed you in the previous graph. Uh, a dollar of earnings in the U.S. is more expensive than in the rest of the world, and that's part of this story. Um, the bars on either side of the, the guesses are uh, the amount of uncertainty um, that is encompassed in this estimate. So, in other words, the, the returns in the emerging markets may be higher, but there's much more uncertainty as to what they'll actually be. Um, we see this theme play out. Uh, here are numbers from J.P. Morgan. So instead of the uncertainty bars, there is a, 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 a axis on this chart, volatility, which is the same as uncertainty, and then the return is on the vertical axis. So the higher up means the higher the ret return is expected. So emerging market equity is the best, but also the most volatile than private equity. Uh, EFA means uh, Europe and Pacific outside the U.S. Um, and then you can also see U.S. Uh, uh, again is lower than the rest of the world, and most of the reason is that uh, um, right here, uh, U.S. large companies right here. Uh, most of the reason is for that difference in valuation when you get really down to how they construct these returns. And then here's research affiliates, uh, Rob Arnott's firm, same drill volatility on the lower axis, return, and you can see uh, returns expected from emerging markets and foreign stocks way above um, the U.S. Uh, returns for over the next 10 years. Um, I have one more set. I'm not going to go over these, but this is uh, Jeremy Grantham's firm uh, showing the same thing. These estimates are from November for, uh, for seven years instead of 10. And real means these are after inflation, so you mentally have to add in what you think inflation is going to be over the next seven, uh, seven years to get the correct return, and that would be about 2.3%. But the theme is that emerging markets, then um, international, then U.S., um, that's, kind of, that's a consensus uh, in these longer-term uh, forecasts. Um, so I'm going to finish uh, with how to think about uh, fixed income here in income investments for uh, people who pay taxes. Um, and I have d uh, yields from different markets, and these have improved markedly. Um, we calculate the returns from 10 year treasuries, uh, corporate bonds, high yield bonds, uh, AA municipal bonds, and treasury uh, inflation protected securities 10 year. Um, we look at the pre tax yield, we take out federal taxes at the 37% bracket, and then we take out Arizona taxes uh, and look at the after-tax yield. So this is um, cash flow available to spend, but if you want to preserve your purchasing power, you want to retain that cash flow to your principal uh, to offset the effects of inflation, which we have here is 2.3. So 10-year treasuries, are you basically breaking even after taxes? Corporate bonds, we're making about 0.8%. High yield bonds is three, which is pretty good. Uh, but again, high yield bonds are, are fairly risky. Uh, and then there are municipal bonds, uh, which um, right now have a pretty good after tax, after inflation yield um, is a good place to look for fixed income. And the tips, uh, because you pay federal tax on the yield plus the effect of inflation, there's a big tax burden and it's a break even like the 10 year treasury. If inflation comes in more than 2.3, then um, they will do better. So go, here, here is kind of our counsel going forward. We are uncertain as to whether interest rates and inflation are gonna stop going up or the economy is gonna turn over. Therefore, um, uh, that is, makes more speculative assets still very risky in our view. Uh, so we are not, of a mind to go into any of the speculative uh, sectors that were hurt uh, last year at this point. I think in the in private assets, private equity, venture capital, uh, private real estate, private debt, a lot of the effects of in, uh, inflation and rising interest rates have yet to filter through those spaces because they're not marked to market. We can't see them, the pricing. 
And as, as the effects of higher rates filter through in terms of doing new deals, refinancing debt on older deals, uh, most of which will come due two or three years from now, I think that uh, if, if rates are still elevated, that will be problematic in those areas. Um, and uh, if you don't believe in the consensus going forward that inflation is going to be 2.3%, which I do not, I think it will be higher, um, then having investments in your portfolio that are as a hedge that are a little sensitive to unexpected inflation is a smart idea. Those would be things like uh, materials, energy, traditional energy, precious metals, uh, things like that. Maybe just a little bit more than you might have had in the past. What is different long run, what's uh, coming down the tracks at us uh, that we can see is um, uh, budget deficits in the United States as the costs in our uh, entitlement programs grow and uh, uh, there's more and more deficit spending in, uh, throughout the government that's become accepted. There's very little pushback to balance, to bring the budget anywhere near close to balance right now. Um, at some point in time, that's going to cause a problem, and we either have to cut spending, raise taxes, or print money, or a combination of the three, which will probably be what happens. Uh, but that's inflationary, the latter part, and uh, we expect that to happen in the long run. Um, so not just in the next year or two, the noise, but in the long the long run trend, which is fairly visible, um, as soon as the market grabs hold of that, it's going to um, have an effect on investment portfolios and in, in, uh, raising inflation expectations. And, and it's probably a good idea to be prepared for that. So as always, uh, if you have any questions um, for us or you want to talk about your investment portfolios, uh, we're happy to do that. Please call your team at Versant. Uh, uh, if you have questions for me, I'm happy to take them as well. Uh, we wish you all a very happy and prosperous 2023. Um, look forward to seeing you throughout the year and uh, look forward to seeing you uh, at the next video. Thank you.